we'll go on into our presentation at this time. And looking at the ways that Dr. King did impact healthcare. This was a statement made from a speech to the Medical Committee for Human Rights in 1966. Of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And then let's see, I have to move, see if I can move this bar from my page here. All right, I think I did it. On January 17th, 2020, this statement was released by CMN Hospitals. Every January, the United States celebrates the lasting legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Not widely known is how his civil rights advocacy made a lasting impact on modern day hospitals, including children's hospitals. More of their statement. When patients enter a hospital, they expect to receive a standard of care that will improve their lives, regardless of who they may, might be. That expectation, unfortunately, has not always been backed up by medical institutions across the United States. African Americans in particular experienced a history of receiving substandard care and outright abuse within the framework of medical science. And this article was written in the vein that things have improved now, this is no longer a problem. But all of us know that unfortunately, we still do have problems. It is much better than it used to be. We were not losing as many lives as in yesteryears when people were not treated at all. But we recently, lost a doctor who had the COVID disease and she released a statement just before her death talking about the inadequacies of the care that she received. And this is from Dr. King's first annual report that was printed in the nation on the state of the civil rights movement. Equality now, the president has power. And I see here Dr. King as a prophet looking way into the future because we would think that he was talking about right now. He was talking about then, but it's still appropriate. Another area in which an executive order can bring an end to a considerable amount of discrimination is that of health and hospitalization. Under the Hill-Burton Act, the federal government grants funds to the states for the construction of hospitals. And I have to move our pictures out of the way so that I can read this part. In spite of this sizable federal report, it is a known fact that most of the federally financed and approved health and hospitalization programs in the South are operated on a segregated basis. In many instances, the Negroes are denied access to them altogether. And now we don't use that word anymore, Negroes, but that's what we used then. <laughs> now we either say Black or African American. The president could wipe out these shameful conditions almost overnight by ordering his Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare not to approve the grants to states whose plans authorize segregation or denial of service on the basis of race. And this has happened, uh, theoretically it's happening everywhere. Um, Certainly, it did improve things when we saw more equity in the care of patients. But as I said, unfortunately, there are still some who do violate this. And 
hopefully with a new administration, we can put in some of these programs again that were helpful in correcting the ills of the system. And then I'm looking at Dr. King as an example of good health. He, he actually was basically a healthy man to be able to do the things that he did. And a statement that he made about his childhood was, it is said that at my birth, the doctors pronounced me a 100% perfect child from a physical point of view. I hardly know how an ill moment feels. So it seems that from a hereditary point of view, nature was very kind to me. I'm going to look at his family. And I said, a loving home produces healthy children. Dr. King said, I have a marvelous mother and father. I can hardly remember a time that they ever argued. It is quite easy for me to think of a God of love, mainly because I grew up in a family where love was central and where lovely relationships were ever present. And we can just kind of look at the strength of his parents there, Daddy King, as he was affectionately called. And his mom, Ms. Alberta Williams King, they called her Mother King. Unfortunately, she was she had a tragic death because she was shot, unfortunately, by uh, invaders from the Klu Klux Klan that came into their church on a Sunday morning and struck her down while she was playing the Lord's Prayer at the organ. And we talk about, you know, I guess I have to put in a plug for women's rights here. You know, we talk about the men, but th the women were just as strong. And she was to have gone through all of these things with uh, their family. And we can see why Martin Luther King became the person that he did. It was his environment. And he was exposed to Dr. William. Mays there at uh, Morehouse. All of those things impacted his life. They, uh, and I was saying he was healthy. They did say that he had uh, a one bad, a habit of smoking. This was never seen publicly. And I certainly never saw it. I was on many of the marches and I have been in his presence and in meetings. And I never saw him smoking, but they said that he did uh, smoke. And, but I, we, as we could see, his parents certainly turned him loose in very good, healthy condition. And that's what sustained him and enabled him to keep a sharp mind and do the things that he did. His language was healing. People just loved to hear him talk, even though he was admonishing many of the ills in society, his words were still peaceful. So here I want you to just talk about some of the healing words of Martin Luther King Jr. He said, we have before us the glorious opportunity to inject a new dimension of love into the veins of our civilization. Another statement, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. Everybody can be great because everybody can serve. And he saw people as the same, the same potential, took time to talk to people that probably most other people would pass by, people in the streets, I've been told. And it helps when we see that and when we can see the greatness in other people and in children and promote that. 
we must learn to live together as brothers or we will perish together as fools. And in that vein, he had another quote, which I don't have on the screen, but I'm going to read it to you. If we do an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, we will be a blind and toothless nation. If you can't fly, then run. If you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. Yes, we do. <laughs> life's most persistent and urgent question is, what are you doing for others? And then he says, I hear so many people that are so gloomy and they see everything just ending, like we're just gonna, the world's gonna be destroyed and it doesn't matter why bother fight, why bother do anything? <laughs> um, but he says, even if I knew that tomorrow the world would go to pieces, I would still plant my apple tree. And I just want to read a couple other statements that he made. One about peace. All men are interdependent. Every nation is an heir of a vast treasury of ideas and labor to which both the living and dead of all nations have contributed. There is no need to fight for food and land. Science has provided us with adequate means of survival and transportation, which make it possible to enjoy the fullness of this great earth. And then I last want to just mention something about the COVID. <laughs> I'm scheduled to get my test this coming week. And I was a little hesitant at first. They announced that it was out, I'm saying, well, I think maybe I'll take it, but I'm, I'm not ready to be in the first group. But when I got the date to take it, I was reminded that I had written a prayer which was published on my church's website. And this was back in, what, April. And I'm just going to read a couple of lines to you because it was a long prayer. And I, but after going back, thinking of what I had said, I said, well, this is the answer to the prayer. We now do have the vaccine, so why would I hesitate to take it? This is what I wrote. Undergird physicians, nurses, and all health professionals with stamina as they perform their duties. Enable them to find the equipment and medical supplies that are needed. May your healing power circulate around sick beds and hospitals, care facilities, and homes. Powerful God, let the visitation of your good spirit be in the scientific laboratories as a cure for this devastating disease is sought. Guide the eyes and hands of scientists as they explore the phenomena of the matter that you created. And Indeed, I'm grateful for that, for the work that's being done at Weiss Hospital. We no longer have to put the medicine on the dime, but we can offer the best. And thanks to the memory of Martin Luther King and the wisdom that he shared and for the way he fought to make our healthcare system quality healthcare for everyone. And I am going to listen in to all of the, the things that are going to be said coming up. 
So thank you very much. I'll turn it back over to Judy at this point. Thank you, Peggy, very much. I'm gonna add Dr. Rose and Dr. Fahm. And if you can just um, unmute yourselves and we can just get started. Peggy, thank you for giving us such a, a good overview of Martin Luther King's perspective and reaction to healthcare inequalities. And some of it still impacts us today. Um, but as we continue to share in um, the improvements in healthcare initiatives, um, as we address um, our communities, our African American, um, Hispanic, and um, Indigenous communities. This is a very good time to talk about the COVID 19 pandemic, to discuss um, the myths, to answer some questions, and to just get down to the ultimate unknown. Um, should we or should we not be vaccinated? So Dr. Fahm and Dr. Rose, I will turn this over to you. Thank you all very much for joining us. Good, good afternoon. I'm gonna let Dr. Pham go ahead and open up for us. Hey, Dr. Rose. Hello everybody. Thank you, Peggy. That was um, such an inspirational talk that you gave and Martin Luther King Day um, has such a special significance uh, you know, to the community at Weiss. I know every year Judy has done such a great job bringing the community together on a day uh, such as this to remember such an important figure as Dr. King um, was and continues to be. So it's uh, my privilege to join you all today to just um, discuss the COVID vaccine. Uh, and I know Dr. Rose and I have, have um, been uh, working very diligently and trying to spread information as much as we can to our community because we believe that knowledge is power and with knowledge you will be able to make informed decisions for yourself as to if the COVID vaccine is right for you and when it will be right for you. So if I may um, share my screen here. Are you all able to see that? Not yet. Okay. There you go. Okay. So just a couple of quick objectives on updating about our current vaccine options. I'd like to have a minute to address the current misconceptions about the vaccine. We'll discuss the current distribution strategies for widespread vaccination in Chicago. And I will be discussing a bit about the variants that you're hearing about in the news as well. Um, just one slide about vaccine innovation. I think one of the biggest concerns that I've heard uh, from our patient population has been how has the COVID vaccine been developed so quickly? And this gives you a very quick overview as to some of our major vaccines that um, were uh, investigated in development since 1880 to present. And you can see the time frame. Um, I just want to highlight that the fastest vaccine developed prior to COVID was the measles vaccine. And that took 10 years and that was lightning speed back then. Um, and here we are with a COVID-19 vaccine uh, just about a year uh, after the pandemic even was announced. And, you know, it, it, we have certainly come a long, long way with our technology. So I'll quickly go through the phases of the vaccine development. You can see here that there typically um, has been a series of seven phases. Uh, the preclinical phase is when companies investigators collect data to support the feasibility and safety of a vaccine. And it usually does involve non-human testing. So uh, in, in animal subjects, just as an example, they look at the toxic and pharmacologic effects of the vaccine itself. And once they pass that phase is when they actually start entering into phases of human study. So the phase one is generally a small study. It usually involves anywhere from 10 to 20 patients, so a very small group of people, and it's generally healthy people. 
It typically does take one to two years and they're looking at the safety and the immune response at the different doses of the um, vaccine itself. From there, they move on to phase two where it's a larger study. They start looking at hundreds of people. This phase typically takes double the amount of time phase one <coughs> takes, so two to three years. Again, looking at the safety, efficacy, and they're starting to try to decide what the optimal dose and vaccine schedule is for this particular vaccine. Phase three, you're looking at thousands of people typically takes two to four years. This is the phase that we have heard the most about um, with our COVID vaccine when Pfizer and Moderna announced their phase three. I know that I was um, certainly, uh, my ears perked up and they were able to readily get thousands and thousands of people. Um, Pfizer had 40,000, Moderna had 30,000 people. Once they're able to pass the phase three, this is when they apply for regulatory review. This is when you heard in the news, they uh, requested the FDA to review the vaccines for emergency use authorization. And this is typically when the agencies look at the trial data, they look at all the um, safety information, and usually it takes one to two years for all of this to happen. And manufacturing does typically start during this regulatory review, but widespread manufacturing typically does not occur, unlike how COVID vaccine um, was developed. And then the clinical phase four is after that vaccine has received approval, of course, the scientists continue to study it. They look at the effectiveness once it's out in the real world, in people, how they do with safety and efficacy. So after running through those phases, I'm sure you uh, still wonder, well, how has this vaccine been developed so quickly when I've just mentioned, it typically takes years to get through all these phases. And the bottom line is it has come down to money and lots of it. During the pandemic, the unique thing about COVID is that it didn't affect just one country or two countries. It affected the entire world and it affected world countries that are extremely wealthy, as well as countries that are indigent. The wealthier countries were able to uh, put money towards resources um, and uh, support pharmaceutical companies that already had research years in the making. Uh, pri public funders, private philanthropists were able to donate significant sums of money. And then these companies were able to start large scale testing and manufacturing of vaccines. And because they felt the confidence of having some financial support, they started manufacturing vaccines that they knew probably wouldn't work, but the research that would allow for them to start the manufacturing would be able to potentially help them manufacture a different type, but they needed to be able to start their trials quickly. Just as um, one exact example, Operation Warp Speed, the government, the US government was able to uh, contribute $10 billion towards the research of COVID-19 vaccine. I'm sure this incentivized the pharmaceutical companies just a little bit. I mentioned here um, already that there was years of previous research on related viruses. Um, just as an example, mRNA vaccines had already been looked at for influenza, Zika, rabies and cytomegalovirus. And so they already knew that this technology could work. They just hadn't put it into production yet. They also knew that there were ways to manufacture the vaccines quickly. And of course, with all the push to uh, be able to help society, the regulators were moving much more quickly than normal. So by the numbers, just so you all know, we have 240 COVID-19 vaccines in development currently. 43 are in clinical testing and nine are in use. There are eight different platforms out there and only one vaccine has been abandoned in trial. So the one vaccine abandoned in trial, I do wanna make a special mention. It was an Australian company that developed this vaccine and why they abandoned it is because the participants in the trial started coming up as HIV positive. And what it appeared to be is these were false positives 
the vaccine developed by this company was actually it contained a piece of a protein fragment that also is found in HIV and it posed no risk to human health. However, the body's immunity detected it, started developing an antibody against it. And then with our current technology for HIV testing, the tests started reflexing positive. So that was obviously quite alarming to the participants and hence the vaccine was abandoned. I'll just quickly show you some of the platforms that are being looked at. Um, the one that we are most familiar with right now is the RNA platform. That's the one on the right, third one down in the blue. Um, but I just wanted to flash a slide here to show you. These are all the different ways scientists and pharmaceutical companies are looking to develop uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. And I'll just show you again, um, that these are the nine vaccines that have been approved for worldwide use. Uh, we have heard about Pfizer and Moderna, the top two there, but you can see the other countries around the world that have been working at this just as hard. China and Russia are two countries that have also poured significant resources into their companies to develop vaccines for their population. So this picture highlights where in our world COVID vaccine has been administered. And it may be hard for you to see on your screen here, but Israel and the United Arab Emirates are the countries that have the highest per capita number of people who've been vaccinated against COVID-19. This is just another way to see that, and it's impressive. Israel has administered 27.1 doses of COVID vaccine per 100 people. That's 24% of their population that's now already been vaccinated. Um, in comparison, the US has administered 3.7 doses per 100 people, which is about 3.2% of our population. So we've got a little ways to go for our vaccine rollout. This slide just shows the total number of vaccine doses administered as of yesterday. Uh, worldwide, we've got 37 and a half million. The United States um, does uh, lead the pack with actually the number of vaccine doses that have been administered. But as you've just heard, it is unfortunately just a small percentage of our population. We need to continue to push. And this um, slide shows the vaccine policy. So as you know, uh, here in the United States, we have discussed about tiering our population so that those most vulnerable and those most at risk for exposure have been allowed to receive the vaccine first and foremost. Uh, we have been in tier 1A here in the US and that has included healthcare workers and uh, our nursing home population, as well as staff that work in the nursing home. Um, Around the world, though, it hasn't all been the same. The most universal vaccine policy is actually in Latvia, where pretty much anyone who wants it over the age of 16 can get it. The second most um, open policy has been for the United Arab Emirates, where it's the vulnerable and some others. And uh, the other countries that are in kind of a yellowish, lighter yellow, Canada, Italy, Saudi Arabia, Israel, they are allowing all vulnerable groups to receive vaccination. So I'm sure this has helped in their rollout and being able to administer it uh, a little more quickly than what we've been able to do here in the United States. I'd like to address some of the myths that we've been hearing. So the first myth I hear a lot is, can the COVID vaccine make you sick? A lot of people say, well, when I get the flu vaccine, I feel terrible, it makes me sick, I'm never gonna get it again. Well, what I can say is the COVID-19 vaccine cannot make you sick. It does not contain any live virus. What it does do is it does trigger your immune system and that can make you feel unwell. People report low-grade fevers, fatigue, muscle aches. It typically occurs within a day or two of receiving the vaccine and also subsides within that period of time. People do report that after the second dose, they feel a little bit more severe in regards to the side effect profile than the, they did the first dose. But again, it's extremely variable and it's hard to predict. 
Some people said they had a sore arm the first dose and they felt nothing the second dose and vice versa. The second myth I hear a lot about is can the COVID-19 vaccine alter my DNA? And this one um, has been really, really prominent in social media. And I'll again say no, the COVID-19 vaccines cannot alter your DNA in any way. mRNA does not enter into the nucleus of our cell at all, so it cannot affect or interact with our DNA. This one is another social media myth. The COVID-19 vaccine was developed to control the general population, either through microchip tracking or nanotransducers in our brains. And this one, you know, I think Bill Gates feels pretty terrible about because it's being attributed to what he said. He made some comments when he was discussing the, uh, his thoughts about the vaccine, about how nice it would be to have a digital certificate of vaccine records. Well, like the game of telephone, that somehow got misinterpreted to him saying that the vaccine itself would contain a chip to be able to track people who had received the vaccine. This is certainly not true in any way, shape or form. And we do not have concerns about this at all in our medical community about this being a way to track our patient population. And just as an aside, I would say that if you or anyone that you know are worried about being tracked, I would be very cautious about your cell phone. That's probably a worse tracker than anything we have on our bodies right now. Another thing that people worry about kind of related to the allergic reaction is, is getting the vaccine worse than getting the actual illness. Well, the media has discussed the number of people who've had severe allergic reactions or even anaphylactic reactions. And it's caused some, some fear, some consternation in people and rightfully so. I think everyone should examine their history of having had allergic reactions to medications, foods, things in the past and discuss it with their physician to determine should they get the vaccine? And if they are okay to get the vaccine, maybe, maybe being in a setting that could allow for appropriate monitoring would give them some confidence moving forward. But I certainly would say that getting the vaccine, you know, is, is unlikely to be worse than getting the actual illness in most cases. COVID vaccines, have they been developed using fetal tissue? Well, so there is no doubt that vaccines have used human fetal cells for development in the past. However, our COVID-19 vaccines that we currently have, the Pfizer and Moderna ones in particular, have not been developed using fetal tissue. The human fetal cells uh, scientifically have been used as ways to generate vast quantities of vectors like the adenovirus, which has been used in different uh, vaccines. In particular, vaccines that have used the fetal tissue are varicella, shingles, hep A, and rubella. Um, this, this research has been uh, around for quite some time. The cell lines used uh, have been from the 1970s and 80s, and these same cell lines have been passed on um, through the years for research purposes and to allow for these vaccines to be developed. But again, COVID-19 vaccines are currently not the ones being used now are currently not being used, uh, used with this technology. And a fact, you can still become infected with SARS-CoV-2 even if you are vaccinated. So I want to highlight this because I think that society needs a way out and the vaccine truly is the way out. However, it does not provide 100% immunity. It appears to be 95% effective at this point. And you can still harbor virus because we think that the vaccine triggers a very robust IgG response. That's the type of antibody you want to have in your body to protect you against anything, everything. However, this vaccine does not trigger an IgA response. And that's the type of antibody that typically sits in our in our nose, in our upper airway tract. And so if you are exposed to COVID, 
we are seeing that people can harbor the virus still in their upper respiratory tract, and there it can replicate. While it may not make you sick or very sick at all, if you sneeze, cough, talk, sing, anything, it can be passed on to someone who may not have been vaccinated yet and still cause severe illness in them. I'll briefly discuss the COVID variants. We all know that viruses constantly change through mutation and new variants of a viruses are expected to occur over time. These will come and go. And the three variant strains we are seeing now, the top one is the United K B117. The CDC has reported 88 cases to date. The last report was on the 15th. And you may have heard on Sunday that one case was reported here in Illinois by Northwestern. It wasn't an individual who had recently traveled to the UK on business. The two other variants we have not seen here in the United States as of yet, but we do suspect that they are here. Uh, South Africa has a variant strain as well as Brazil. And I'd like to end by just showing some numbers from um, the Chicago push for vaccination. So this is just for Chicago proper. 73,405 residents have received the first dose and 23,000 are fully vaccinated. These are the locations that are being rolled out around the city to be able to provide vaccinations. Currently, we are still in tier 1A. So again, healthcare workers, nursing home residents, but the government, the governor, excuse me, just announced this morning that January 25th will begin the rollout for tier 1B. Sooner if they can get things going, but January 25th, so a week from today. And we believe that these are the locations that they will be rolling it out for the tier 1B. Now, tier 1B, as you can see here, are going to be persons age 65 and older, frontline essential workers, which include um, a significant uh, portion of our population. So our grocery store workers, uh, public transportation drivers, just a couple of examples, and then inmates. Um, after our phase 1B uh, population is vaccinated, then it will roll out to phase 1C, as you can see, which are uh, persons aged 16 to 64 with high-risk medical conditions and other essential workers. And lastly, the phase two, which would be the rest of the population. A couple of interesting partnerships, uh, Moderna and Uber have partnered and Uber has um, dedicated up to 10 million ride shares to help our community be able to get to vaccine sites. So if you or, your, or anyone in the community that you know need transportation, please look up Uber. Um, they are committing to help. And uh, Disneyland, um, uh, is one of the major locations in our country that will be opening up for community uh, vaccination as well. We need herd immunity. We need at least 70 to 80% of our population to have immunity to COVID before we can start feeling comfortable that life can return back to a more normal state. And this is the way to get it is to vaccination. Um, just a couple of pictures of our residents who are amazing and who have helped WISE get through our pandemic uh, from start to now. And thank you so much for your time. I'll be available for questions after Dr. Rose is done speaking. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining us this afternoon. And I want to thank uh, Peggy for coordinating coordinating everything, Holly for singing, and uh, of course, our own Judith for um, being so ever present for all these various community events over the years. Uh, I am not going to spend a lot of time talking because you have heard all the scientific facts from my colleague, Dr. Pham, um, and I will just tell you that a portion of what you heard is the exact talk that she recently gave to our medical staff uh, and resident staff uh, doing a update on the COVID um, vaccination and status. Um, she's done a lot of research on it. It's fact, not alternate facts. She gave you the facts. Um, from my uh, standpoint, I realize that uh, today being Martin Luther King's day, 
that uh, one of the things that we needed to do in our community, not just here in Uptown, but throughout the whole country uh, in the world for, for that matter, uh, there are a lot of folks in our African-American, Black uh, uh, Americans uh, community who may still harbor uh, feelings against uh, health care. Uh, and as you heard in the opening talk, you know, one of the things that Martin Luther King, uh, you know, um, pointed out over what, almost 60 years ago uh, was the inequity in health care. And sometimes that inequity is lack of care and other times it's lack of caring. Um, you know, we certainly have made lots of progress over the years. Um, however, uh, we, as Martin Luther King said, we must keep moving forward. Um, and this is one of those times when we need to move forward. We need to move forward to getting over 80% of our population vaccinated. Uh, that is the only way we're going to be able to return to a near normal or back to almost normal um, um, way of life. Um, so I'm here to answer any questions from the audience in terms of uh, vaccination, I would let you know that I had my second dose a week ago today. Um, and in terms of the first dose, uh, 24 hours after I had it, um, I did have soreness in my shoulder. In fact, that uh, following night when I was trying to sleep, I had to sleep on my opposite shoulder. Uh, I thought maybe the second one might do the same thing. And actually it was less soreness. Um, I did hear from several other uh, healthcare workers who are my patients that they did get a little sicker with a second vaccination. And I think that is probably due to the fact that their immune system is, pro is, is probably working really well that when they got the second shot, they had a little bit more reaction. But I'll tell you, there's no one after 48 hours who has said to me uh, that they were not well anymore. So uh, very minimal risk for some major benefits. Um, one second, please. Uh, yeah, uh, very, ma very major benefits with very little risk. Um, and I would encourage everyone, as soon as your tier group opens up and there is adequate uh, vaccines available, be there first in line. Um, in terms of uh, you notice that uh, Truman College was listed as one of the sites and I'm sure that um, as things move closer to next week and the week after, uh, you'll probably hear of other places in the community, including our hospital, uh, that will be offering the vaccines in, uh, for the uh, population. I'll stop there and see if there are any uh, questions from the audience. And thank you again. Now, Peggy, I'm handing Rose, it back over to you. Dr. Rose, I'm gonna allow, um, I'm gonna unmute everyone. Um, we are sort of overlapping into another program, but that's not a big problem. So Paul's class is going to be canceled today. Um, he'll be back with us tomorrow. And if you have questions, please unmute yourself. I have a question, Dr. Rose. Um, are, are teachers going out in the classrooms, why aren't they in the one of the first groups to be vaccinated. What can we do to help our teachers? That's a, that's a good question. And um, I actually think that uh, the 1B group should include them and does include them. Uh, so hopefully um, uh, starting next Monday, uh, they should be able to get their vaccination. I think the biggest problem right now is not necessarily that a teacher, if they came in to any any one of our organizations that are currently vaccinated or healthcare workers, that they would not uh, that they would be denied. I think the problem is the availability of the quantity of vaccines right now. The biggest problem that we have, uh, I think, is the allotment uh, to make sure that we have enough available for those direct healthcare uh, providers and those highest risk patients are at the nursing homes. Uh, but, I, uh, but I believe as soon as the supply is, is, is available, uh, we're going to be getting to those other what we call frontline workers uh, other than the healthcare. And the teachers certainly are the, one of the frontline workers. Do we have to be, uh, I have a question. Do we have to be a Wise Hospital patient to receive a vaccination from Wise Hospital? 
Uh, as of right now, uh, Weiss has not announced how they're going to proceed with their vaccination. They, they, they are having, I think today is the next meeting regarding the vaccination. They're still in the process of vaccinating their own healthcare workers right now. And I believe the next phase will be to offering it to other healthcare workers who do not have a hospital-based practice. Uh, and hopefully by next week, we'll, you know, the 25th, we'll be able to announce how the general public based on the phase 1B would be able to acquire it here at Weiss. They're trying to do all of the uh, semantics and everything that will go along, logistics that would go along with doing that as of right now. I have a question. Is there anywhere at this point for the 1B group to uh, register or and or make uh, an appointment for the vaccination? Uh, Suzanne, I don't know if you want to answer that, but the only thing that I've known about that is a city site where, um, I forgot what the uh, website is now, but I think Suzanne may have it, where you can go for additional information where they will tell you um, if they have registration starting as yet. Right, if you get on CDPH, uh, their website, if you Google it and put in COVID vaccine, they should lead you to a link where you can register your name and then they will be reaching out to you once your tier has uh, come up to be uh, allowed to vaccinate. And what I'm hearing is that those uh, city centers that I had flashed up would be where you would go. Now here at Weiss, what we are likely going to be doing, and we will be ironing out the details of this very quickly, is that uh, we will also be um, providing a way for our community who are interested in receiving vaccination to be able to sign up. And then based on that sign up and our availability, we will reach out to you. Okay, just as a piece of information too, I have registered on the site that you mentioned um, that uh, it's called, it's, a, it's an odd name, it's called COVID Coach, C-O-A-C-H. And I have been getting text messages from them every day asking if I have symptoms. And uh, so I'm, I'm assuming I'm the, on that list and will eventually get further information. But I wondered if there was anything else. Information is changing every day, so it's very quick. Thank you. There's another question. Um, it's pertaining to allergies. If you have allergies, is it safe to take the vaccine? So I can try to answer that. It depends on what allergies, what to, and if significantly allergies to any of the components of the vaccine. So when you are allowed to receive the vaccine, what you will hand, be handed is an emergency use authorization form. On that form is listed exactly what's in the vaccine that you are uh, consenting to. And I would encourage each and every person to read through that list very carefully to see if any of those components uh, sound familiar to you. It may have been in something that you had had a reaction to before. If that is the case, you should not receive that vaccine that day. And you should discuss this with your uh, primary care physician to determine if the reaction to that component of concern was of significance enough to negate the benefit of this vaccine. Yeah, and I would only add one other thing to that. Uh, obviously, you've heard in the news, uh, folks who have so many allergies that they have to walk around with an EpiPen, we're asking them not to take the vaccine uh, until further notice and probably not. But you know, those populations are probably less than 0.0001% of the nation. And as I told a cousin of mine in Connecticut who has exactly that, I said, listen, cuz if the rest of us take care of uh, what we need to do, you won't have anything to, to worry about because we'll be more than uh, enough herd immunity to protect you. Um, so those are the only ones for sure uh, that I think should not. But again, the best thing is always consult with your uh, physician or provider um, regarding your allergies, uh, they would, be the best ones to guide you as to whether or not your allergies um, necessitate avoidance of the vaccine. I want to thank you for um, just sharing something, something, some areas of myths. 
someone asked me last week, week before last, or they was it was suggested to them that they had to have two negative COVID tests to get the vaccination. Now, of course, that's not true. So there is no requirement to be uh, testing negative for COVID. In fact, there is a recommendation that even if you have had COVID, um, you should get vaccinated. Now, the caveat to that is if you have had COVID and are within a 90 day time frame, the your own body's immunity should have been triggered enough to help protect you to a certain extent. We don't know lo how long the natural immunity will last. Studies are showing that depending on how ill you were, if it was mild illness, the immunity does seem to wane at about two to three months. If you were a little sicker, it may last you a little bit longer, six, maybe eight months. We're all hopeful that the immunity being triggered by vaccination is going to be longer lasting, but we do expect that there's gonna be a need for a booster at some interval of time as well. And I think of course, time will tell as we do more research and see um, the trial participants who you know, will be followed uh, through the next few years. Um, but you do not need to have negative COVID testing. As now, may, not be, may not be a question for you all, but then you may have the answer for this. For those of who are being, those of us who are being vaccinated, and who do plan on traveling, um, do we still fall within the guidelines of the 72 hours prior to travel to um, take a COVID test? So, with the travel order, it does not address those who are vaccinated because it recognizes that very few people in society uh, are currently vaccinated. It's pretty much just the healthcare worker. Um, as well as the nursing home residents who are unlikely to be significant travelers. So right now they have not uh, revised or addended their guidelines at all. So for now, even for the healthcare worker needing to travel, we must adhere to the same travel order. Thank you. Agree. I have a question about the sites. Where can we get a list of the, uh, the sites that are giving the vaccine that you had on the screen? Can you sure. tell Go ahead, Judy. No, I'm sorry. I just spoke out of place. Oh, well, so CDPH and IDPH both have lists that are coming out and they're constantly being updated. Um, the list of sites that I had and I can flip through them, maybe if I'm still screen sharing. Let's see here, here they are. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how I can get this to flip off, but um, these are the lists that were uh, released on Friday. But you should be able to find them on the CDPH website. Okay, thank, so, you. thank you for showing that again. Of course. And as Dr. Pham says, this list will probably change almost daily. Uh, at least we hope it to be more expanded. But uh, there'll also be, I think, um, the pharmacies, once they get theirs at uh, CVS and Walgreens, uh, should be announcing uh, their, their schedules and mm -hmm. how to uh, uh, get it there. I'm pretty sure they're going to do it by appointment. For those, the, those locations you just posted, uh, do we have to register to receive vaccines or is it you can just stand in line and get it? So everything is done um, via registration at this point. Um, right. We want to try to control, um, you know, the situation as much as possible for your comfort and safety. So you just register through city website, the, uh, the Chicago coach website. That's right. I would get on that website and my understanding of it right now, which I, um, we had a person just discuss that site. So maybe they would be willing to share a little bit more detail. But when I last looked at the site, it was simply asking for your name and registration information. They were not allowing uh, any requests for dates. Uh, they were not re uh, allowing for requests for locations either. Thank you. I have a basic um, question. When you get Pfizer vaccine, you uh, the Pfizer vaccine is 94, 95% effective, right? 
that's what I heard. What does that mean? Does it mean 95% of people who got it has immunity? No. Everybody has it, but 95% immunity. Exactly. Do you understand my question? Yes, uh, they say it's 95% effective, meaning that it is 95% effective against the person who, uh, the, the person who gets the vaccine yeah. would be resistant to getting very serious illness, if at all any, um, of COVID. Okay. Thank you. I guess my analogy would be uh, if you had a 95% chance of winning the big lotto, you'd go ahead and take a chance at it. <laughs> we will. <Right. laughs> well, we've gotten a very good response from our senior population, Dr. Rose and Dr. Baum. Um, so it's very surprising. Um, and they're just anxiously waiting for it to roll out and be available. Yeah, that's what I've had in my practice also. Uh, all last week, I was getting calls and emails from all my patients. And, um, you know, most of them want to know when. A few yeah. of them want to know if, but the majority of them want to know when. Yes. And I am so thrilled to hear that. I know that there has been some vaccine hesitancy, um, you, you know, kind of discussed in the media. And it it made me very concerned. How could we really promote how important this vaccine is for our society to be able to move forward? Uh, so that's, that warms my heart and that's reassuring. And you know, Dr. Rose and I truly are working so hard to figure out how can we allocate what we can to our community as fast as we can, because we do have a vulnerable patient population that belongs to the Weiss family we've got to get them vaccinated and we're going to work really hard to push that out. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Do we have any other questions? I know we have a mixed group here and we have a lot of staff. Well, we have, I'm not gonna say a lot of staff, um, but we have some staff and we have some of our um, members. Um, now's the time, ask your questions. Share your reactions or response. or just give a thumbs up if this is okay with you. And we're ready to move on. I don't see anything else in the chat box. Um, okay, someone is asking, they had the flu vaccine, um, they had a reaction to the flu vaccine, a bad reaction a long time ago. Should they take the COVID vaccine? Answer is yes. And if you know me, I'm a chicken, and I took it. <laughs> You're a chicken. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Yeah. But Dr. Pham and Dr. Rose, thank you once again. I am going to take it. Thank you. No more questions. Pardon? Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, uh, thank you so fun. much. Well, thank you guys for joining us and thanks for the invitation. It surely is uh, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to end with Holly um, with one last song. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and I got mine, so. Hello. Next week I go for my second shot, so I'm, in, I'm, I'm right there. in the water, <clears throat> wait in the water, children, wait in the water, 
God's gonna trouble the water. Who's that young girl dressed in red? Wave in the water. Must be the children that Moses led. God's gonna trouble the water. Oh, wave in the water. Wave in the water, children. Wave in the water. God's gonna trouble the water. Who's that young girl dressed in a white? Wave in the water. Must be the children of the Israelite. Oh, God's gonna trouble the water. Wade in the water, wade in the water, children, wade in the water. God's going to trouble the water. Ooh, yeah. that young girl dressed in blue wave in the water must be the children that's coming through god's gonna trouble the water yeah wade in the water wade in the water children wade in the water God's going to trouble the water. If you don't believe I've been redeemed, wait in the water. Just see the Holy Ghost looking for me. God's going to trouble the water. Wait in the water. Wait in the water, children, wait in the water. God's going to trouble the water. God's going to trouble the water. Thank you, Holly. As we conclude our Martin Luther King Jr. 2021 program, I just want to thank <laughs> Love it. I want to thank all of our, our members and staff for participating, um, for supporting us. I want to thank, thank Peggy Griffin, who, um, I mean, there's so much talent in this community, so much talent that's just been attracted to Weiss that is just unbelievable, but also heartwarming. Um, Peggy, um, who's been our keynote speaker for our Martin Luther King program for the past four years, um, who's an educator, civil rights activist, um, just an all around genuine person, very well versed. I'd like to thank Holly, who is one of, is a volunteer who, is always available for song. And we tend to step out and join her in her um, singing endeavors. But I'd like to also thank our wise physicians, Dr. Um, Suzanne Pham and Dr. Clement Rose for joining us today and just bringing us some more information and insight into the COVID-19 pandemic and um, vaccination. So I'm gonna sign off. Um, thank you very much, Barbara. You're so welcome, thank you. Anything anyone want to add before we conclude? Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Love the song.
Love this song. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful voice, Holly. Hey, Tom. Hi. How are you? Good. <laughs> wow, look at you. I'm still in my bathrobe, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> You're with us. That's the most important piece. You're with us. It's great seeing you. Likewise. Everything. Yeah. I'm going to 